Hey, uh, good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Bass. I'm the Director of Publications here at the Oklahoma Historical Society. We are really happy to welcome you today to From Tulsa to Beyond, African-American Genealogy in the Indian Territory and Oklahoma. In just a moment, I'm going to introduce our presenter, Nika Smith. She will give her presentation and then we'll have some time for questions. Um, if you have a question at any time during the presentation, please feel free to put it in the Q&A or the chat and we will um, get that taken care of uh, at the end of the session. All right. Our presenter today is Nika Smith. She is a professional photographer, speaker, host, consultant, and documentarian. With more than 20 years of experience as a genealogist, Smith has extensive knowledge of African ancestral genealogy and reverse genealogy, and is also an expert in genealogical research in the Northeastern Louisiana area and in researching enslaved communities. She has diverse and varied experience in media with a background in audio, video, and written communications. She has appeared on the Today Show, CNN, MSNBC, on the series, Who Do You Think You Are? And has been interviewed by the Oakland Tribune, The Undefeated, National Geographic, and Time Magazine. She is the host of Black Pro Gen Live, an innovative web show with more than 125 episodes focused on people of color genealogy and family history. She's a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and a member of two lineage societies, the Sons and Daughters of the Middle Passage and the National Society of Daughters of the American Revolution. She's a past board member of the California Genealogical Society and the African American Genealogical Society of Northern California. She served as the chair of the Outreach and Education Committee for the African American Genealogical Society of Northern California and is the former project manager for the Alameda County Youth Ancestral Project in California, a program through which more than 325 children were taught the value of family history. We are so happy today to have Nika Smith with us to present about From Tulsa to Beyond, African American Genealogy in the Indian Territory and Oklahoma. Thanks, Nika. Thank you so much for that awesome introduction. Oseo, how are you? I'm so glad you guys are here. And, and I have to say to start for today, um, I am so honored to have this opportunity. I am an individual whose family, um, a couple of folks just birthed the 10th generation of our family that has connections to the Indian Territory and to Oklahoma. And so I don't take it lightly that um, this is an incredible opportunity that I've been given. Um, before I start, I definitely want to thank a few people um, who got me to this place, who were who have been with me the entire time that I have been on this journey, learning about my ties to the Indian Territory and to Oklahoma. I want to make sure first that I thank um, my 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 partners in crime in the Oklahoma Freedmen Collective, um, which are a group of us who got together who really want to focus on telling the histories and stories of those um, who were freedmen of the five tribes. I also wanna make sure that I shout out, especially Angela Walton Waji, along with Terry Ligon, um, and the fact that they really helped um, build the foundation for me um, just to be able to connect with this history and are super assets and mentors of mine in this space. And I would not be here without that. And last but not least, I wanna make sure that I thank my family, the Rogers and the Vans who are from Vanita and Nawada. Um, if you are connected to those families, be sure to shout out in the chat. Um, those are our, you know, two communities that my family has been in um, as connections to for a long time. And so I really want to say that, and of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Ike Rogers, because, you know, he is my ancestor who is constantly guiding me. Um, you may notice that I've got some photos behind me, and I made sure that I put up images of my Oki ancestors. Um, you'll see a photo of my great grandfather right there, a couple great uncles, my great grandmother, great aunt. And my, my aunt, who passed away at the age of 15 um, while going to school in Kansas City, um, she is an original Dawes enrollee. Um, she was on the approved role. So you know that they will be here with me. All right, let's get started. We got a lot to cover today. I am so excited to share this content for um, from Tulsa to beyond. So let's go ahead and jump in. One of the things that I want to tell you to start is that most of the images that you're going to see today are images that are available in the gateway that is provided by the Oklahoma Historical Society. If you have not utilized that as a resource, I highly suggest it, okay? And I kid you not, these images, I literally got all of them, these beautiful children that you're seeing right now. But, you know, the others that are there, the majority of them are from 
the Oklahoma Historical Society. So shout out to my people there um, who, who are our gracious hosts for today. All right, so let's get started. What are we talking about? Okay, we're gonna dig into the history of the Indian Territory. And of course, we're gonna talk about what came after, which is Oklahoma. This story is very similar to ones that you will see uh, from communities that border the Mississippi River, where their control is, is, is maintained by other countries. And then of course, they end up getting absorbed by the United States and of course are part of the United States. And so let's talk about that. And when we set this up, we have to have a conversation around the area prior to the forced removal. And I'm gonna qualify what forced removal is in just a second. But when we're talking about ancient times, we have to give light to the many First Nations groups that were in the state of Oklahoma or what is now Oklahoma or the Indian Territory prior to what we know today. And we're talking about groups such as the Wichita, the Cato and the Osage, okay? Those were groups that settled in the area that is now Oklahoma. By 1541, we have an expedition by Francisco Vasquez de Coronado. It's a Spanish uh, expedition. And, and what we also need to mention with this expedition, and of course, again, a lot of the history I'm giving you is, is on the website of the Oklahoma Historical Society, okay? They've got incredible articles. Again, I cannot, I'm gonna tell you, you're gonna get tired of me mentioning the Historical Society because they've laid this out so clearly for us, okay? Now, when we go back to the Spanish expedition of Francisco Vasquez de Coronado, they mention in the documentation of the Spanish expedition that there were 240 mounted soldiers, 60 foot soldiers, and 800 Indians and enslaved people. Note the date, that's 1541. We're in 2021. Now, you know I'm bad at math, but somebody do the calculation. That's a long time ago, right? And in addition to those 800 Indians and enslaved people, we have hundreds of heads of cattle and horses that were also a part of that 1541 expedition. Now, when we move forward in history, when we get to the early 18th century or the 1700s, the area that is Oklahoma was claimed by France and additional First Nations had migrated to the area. But then when we get to 1803, the area that makes up Oklahoma was part of the Louisiana Purchase. Remember, I just hearkened back to the places in the Delta, like where I'm sitting right now, right? In Tennessee, I'm on Chickasaw land. This, this area was inhabited by the Chickasaw before the forced removal. I know that, right? And so Oklahoma was part of the Louisiana Purchase, right? Then we get to the 1810s and this is where voluntary removal begins, okay? Consider that a lot of people, they have learned in school through various resources that the forced removal or the trail of tears took place. But what folks don't realize is there were scores of people who voluntarily removed. And some of my ancestors, slaveholders in the Cherokee Nation were among those who voluntarily removed. And they started to go to areas like Northwest Arkansas, places like Fort Smith and even you know, further north than that. And they also, they migrated into the area that became Northeast Oklahoma or what is the Cherokee Nation now, as well as all of the Eastern part of what is Oklahoma now, okay? So we're, again, when you talk about the forced removal and when you talk about the removal period, right? There was a voluntary removal that happened first. And then when we get to the 1830s to the 1840s, we're talking about the forced removal, okay? Being the Trail of Tears, where thousands of, of those who were part of the five tribes, being the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Muscogee Creek, and the Seminole Nations, where they were forcibly removed from their land due to treaties with the United States government, and they were removed from their land by gunpoint. And thousands of my people and thousands of people from the five tribes, which we have to qualify, it was not just those who are known as being by blood, but it was also their enslaved who were not just voluntarily removed, which happened in the, 18, in the 1810s, but they were also forcibly removed. And the numbers vary on the number of enslaved people who were a part of this journey, okay? This arduous journey. There were enslaved, there were free people of color, which number several thousand. So here's the thing, especially when you talk about voluntary removal and forced removal, you also have to qualify that it wasn't just quote unquote by blood. It was they're enslaved and was also free people of color. 
And there's an incredible image that at one point was hanging um, in the Oklahoma Historical Society. I heard it was was preserved um, and went through some um, some pre preservation efforts and it's hanging somewhere there now, but I have to give Angela um, credit for sending this to me. But it's a mural by an artist named Elizabeth James that depicts the arrival of the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma in the 1830s. And it was painted in 1938, between 1938 and 1939, and it's an eight by 15 foot mural. What do you notice about the people in this mural? Use the chat. You see a federal uh, officer mounted on a horse to the right. You see a home in the background. You see people walking. There's a family. Uh-huh. Let me see if more of you, if more of you see it. They look downtrodden. Not enough people of African descent represented. Slaves, wagons, children, and enslaved human. Look behind the woman standing in red with her head covered. Standing behind her is a dark-skinned child. This is not even a man. This is a child and slave who is carrying part of their belongings. So when we talk about the forced removal of the five tribes, we've got to have a conversation around the fact that enslaved people were also there and they were also subjected to the same treatment, but perhaps even worse. In fact, scholarship is telling us now that not only were enslaved people on the trail walking it, but that enslaved labor was used to clear the path for the people to walk on. Right. So this story is shifting and it's changing as more and more information is made available. But what I want you to walk away with is don't ever think about this story from the vantage point that enslaved people and that black people weren't there. All right, now let's talk about the, the period after forced removal, because this is, I think, where people, we are able to visualize this because of popular culture movies, right? So when we talk about Oklahoma, okay, and the territory, it was established in 1890. Before that, it was the Indian Territory, okay? And it was made up of the five tribes, right? And of course, other nations. Um, but we have the, even the name Oklahoma is a First Nations name. You have Oklahoma, which is people, and Humma, which is red, which which those, that's, that's I want to say it was Choc, no, it's, Choc, it's Choctaw, it's Choctaw, okay? And so with that, you start to have the land runs that begin, right? Which they start the year prior, okay? What are land runs? Think of all those old movies and Westerns that you saw where it was like, go! And the people are, they're on, riding on the horses. Yeah, let's get our land. Let's like settle in our land, right? Land runs began, and that was as a result of the Homestead Act of 1862. What is that? That means that heads of household over the age of 21 could claim up to 160 acres of surveyed, unclaimed public domain land, okay? Title is established after they have lived on the land for five years, made certain improvements, and paid registration fees, okay? And the system was chaotic. Do you hear me? Later, they relied on lotteries, right, an auction-style system. And so the land run, it happens sort of in phases. You have the unassigned lands, right, that are not, you know, that are not part of any uh, First Nations group, those go in 1889. Then in 1891, you have the Sac and Fox, Iowa, Shawnee, and Potawatomi lands. 1892, you have the Cheyenne and Arapaho Reservation. 1893, my people, Cherokee Outlet, that happens then. Then you have the Kickapoo Reservation in 1895. And then in 1901, the Kiowa, Comanche, Apache Reservation, and the Wichita Cato Reservation. Then following after that, we have the Big Pasture. So there were several land runs, okay? And so I'm, I'm calling this out because you have to remember that while white Americans came and were part of these land runs, so were black people. They had a goal, I've heard a historian mention, to get 40,000 African Americans or black people to the, what was Oklahoma to these public lands. And that they only were able to attract about 10,000, but there was so much power in the 10,000 that did come. And remember, there were already black people there. The formerly enslaved of the five tribes, they were already in Oklahoma, what became Oklahoma. So those 10,000, they were joining scores of other people and we'll qualify exactly how many were there in a little bit. 
Then we have the proposed state of Sequoia. Okay, this is when the those who were in the Indian Territory were like, look, we can't get with this, this, this Oklahoma situation that you guys are talking about. We want to form our own state of all the separate nations. And that did not happen because <laughs> we ended up with Oklahoma becoming or being admitted as a 46th state on November 16, 1907. Okay. Now, something else that I have to also talk about in terms of background, we have to talk about the first law on the books in the state of Oklahoma. No, within a month and two days, they got together and decided that the first law in the state of Oklahoma would be an act to promote the comfort of passengers on railroad streetcars, urban, inner urban, suburban cars, and at railroad stations. What is that? It was a law to qualify segregation. That was Senate Bill 1 in Oklahoma. You would think, right, we've got all of these opportunities for people to come and grow and, and, and build their families and, and build generational wealth and all of that. But the first law we're going to put on the books, this is what we're thinking about, is the separation of races. So this is what ushers in Jim Crow, right? Although it was there before. Because when we talk about the First Nations, we talk about the five tribes who practice chattel slavery, Jim Crow was there before this law. It's just it became codified into the state of Oklahoma. It's like it, can, it was a continuance of other things that, that had already taken place, right? And so now we've got a state, but we also have to talk about July of 2020, McGirt versus Oklahoma. If you did not follow this case, go back and do your education on it. But this is when the United States Supreme Court ruled that a major portion of Eastern Oklahoma remains First Nations reservation, which means that, it, it, that the Cherokee Nation and the, and the Muscogee Creek Nation and the Choctaw and the Chickasaw and the Seminole Nations, that those bounds are, those reservations are still intact which means that their laws and how they govern and everything is still there. In fact, I remember when McGirt happened and the decision was made, when you went to Google Maps right after, and when you go there now, just pop a tab open as you're listening to this, go to Oklahoma and note that it tells you the bounds of all of those nations. Have you noticed that? It does. All right, so now that we hit our background, I gave you all the context on who was there, what they were doing, what countries and whoever else occupied the land. Let's have a conversation about my favorite topic, right? Let's talk about it, right? Yes, there's comments in the chat about the governor wanting to take down McGirt. It's not happening. Good luck. Good luck. I wish you luck, Mr. Stitt. Um, but we're talking about Freeman. 89ers and how our history is deep when it comes to the state of Oklahoma. Yes, Oklahoma is one of the newer states, but when you talk about black folks in Oklahoma, baby, we've been there for a long time. And of course, we got to start with the freedmen of the five tribes. Who, who are the freedmen? What are they? How, what is this group? Okay. And we're going to take a quote directly from me and my crew at the Oklahoma Freedmen Collective. These are people of African descent formerly enslaved in the five tribes or free black people in the nations. The term may also refer to descendants of original freedmen, okay? These are individuals who were enslaved or were free people of color within the Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Muscogee Creek and Seminole nations. Now, what's interesting about this is whenever I bring this up to people, Folks are shocked. Number one, because they don't know that the five tribes largely sided with the Confederacy during the Civil War. I'm going to say that again. Okay. The five tribes largely sided with the Confederacy during the Civil War to preserve the institution of enslavement, but there were people within the nations, right, who also fought on the side of the Union. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Some of them were slaveholders who fought alongside their enslaved for the union, okay? Now, because the five tribes aligned with the Confederacy, they entered into a treaty with the US government in 1866, which abolished slavery in the Indian territory. Notice I did not say that the Emancipation Proclamation or that the 13th Amendment abolished slavery in the Indian territory. It did not. These nations were nations within the bounds or the confines of the United States, which means they had their own laws, their own jurisdiction, all of that stuff, okay? And that means that even if you 
if Lincoln freed, you know, or signed the Emancipation Proclamation, even if Congress passed the 13th Amendment in January of 1865, that had no bearing on the Indian Territory. None. So that meant that even though some of our councils did abolish slavery, right, during the war, right after it started, technically the treaty is what solidified the end of enslavement, okay? And that meant that Juneteenth for our ancestors on, you know, June 19th, 1865, baby, we didn't really get to celebrate that until the next year, okay? Now, this is the thing. The treaty provisions were different for every nation. You had to return within a certain amount of time. You had to meet certain provisions in order for you to be considered a citizen of the nation. Now, with the Cherokee, you had to return within six months of the Treaty of 1866. And so what you start to see happen is that later on, when you have things like the Dawes Commission come and other things where um, there are payments or annuities being paid out to, to the, the people of the five tribes, the freedmen start to be edged out because at that early juncture, and we're even still seeing this now, people think, oh, they fought and they got their, no. Citizenship in the nations has been an ongoing issue ever since the treaty. Yes, since 1866. We have to think about prior to my cousin Marilyn Van and her seeing through our case with the Cherokee Nation. We have to think about Bernice Riggs. We have to think about all the other people that filed cases. This has been a long continuum, right? It's, it's so much, it's such a long history. We could spend, maybe ask them to have me come back to just talk about Friedman because we could sit here for the next three years <laughs> and do this, okay? And so what are we talking about, right? Let's quantify, okay? And you're looking at pictures of my family, my gorgeous family. In fact, that's my grandmother, little girl right here. All right, so let's talk about statistics. There were statistics that were provided um, on the Indian tribes to the Union Agency in the Indian Territory. And this is as of November 8th, 1877. And this is part of an incredible collection um, that I'm gonna spend some time talking about later called Microfilm Publication 234. It's more than a thousand rolls of microfilm. And I often feel that a lot of people who research the Indian Territory, as well as Freedmen, have completely overlooked this collection. And when I tell you it is good genealogical eating, is good genealogical eating. So based on this, st these set of statistics that were kept by the Union Agency of the Indian Territory, okay, as of November 8th, 1877, there were 3,500 freedmen in just the Cherokee Nation. Now, the terms that they use are interesting because the Cherokees noted it as Black Indians by treaty. That's how we referred to them. The Creeks are referred to as Black Indians by treaty. There were 2,500 of them. Choctaws, notice the pivot. Negroes emancipated by the Treaty of 1866. There were 4,000 Choctaws. Chickasaws were also noted as Negroes emancipated by the Treaty of 1866. There were 2,300 of them. Seminoles were considered Black Indians by treaty. There were 506. And when you total it all together, that's more than 12,000 freedmen as of 1877, within 11 years of the Treaty of 1866, there were 12,000 of us. What does this look like when you get to the Dawes Commission? Oh, let's talk about it, okay? There were 3,900 plus Cherokee freedmen who were on the approved Dawes roll. This is not accounting in individuals who were rejected, okay? There were 5,000 plus Choctaws. There were almost 5,000 Chickasaws, over 5,500 Creeks, and 950 Seminoles. That means that, that there were 20,000 of us by 1906. And that was just the people who were approved. You're looking at photos of actual people who were enrolled by the Dawes Commission. If you start clockwork, you have Mayfield Riley, who was a Creek right? Caesar Bruner, who was a Seminole. Sally Walton, who is the grandmother of Angela Walton Raji, who was a Choctaw. Gladys Ligon, who was the aunt of Terry Ligon, who was a Chickasaw. And then my two aunts, Aunt Clarence, who I mentioned to you earlier, who died at the age of 15, and Aunt Edna Rogers, who were Cherokee. So consider, freedmen of the five tribes are not niche. We are not a small group. There were 20 thousand plus of us in 1906. Now just do the math at how expansive we would we are at this point. 
And the only way we can really quantify that is through citizenship efforts. I know that that 3,900 plus Cherokees that were freedmen as of the Dawes Commission in 1906, there are 8,000 of us enrolled right now. And that's just because our chief, Chief Hoskin, just gave those numbers more recently. So when we're talking about freedmen, what are we finding in records, okay? You've got to remember, these are separate governments that existed within the bounds of the United States, okay? And because of that, you're going to have tribal roles or censuses or lists. You're looking at one from ancestry, okay? This is a Caesar, Caesar Bruner Band Seminole Nation. This is them receiving their payouts. Typically, right, you are going to find lists and things that were created or censuses based on um, certain, be certain benefits having to be dispersed within the nations, okay? So it's not like with the United States Census where we know, okay, 1880, 1900, 1910, it's not always that syntax. Sometimes it'll be off, like the Cherokee Nation, 1893, 1880, right? You have all kinds of 1867 Tompkins Road, just random years, because a lot of times it was, it was for a specific reason. So you're gonna look for tribal roles, censuses, and lists. A lot of these things exist on Ancestry. You can also find iterations of them on the Oklahoma Historical Society, as well as the National Archives website. You're also going to look at tribal government documents. What do I mean by that? We're talking about things like courts and, and, and um, I've seen emancipations for the formerly enslaved within records of the Cherokee Nation. Look, give me some on CHN with the, see, the CHN collection for the Oklahoma Historical Society. There are iterations of these, these tribal specific government records that are on Ancestry, but most of them are not type in the name and search. You've got to browse to get to them. Or again, you can head to the Oklahoma Historical Society to look at the records on microfilm. They also have them digitized at FamilySearch. But a lot of the records that I found, you can't view them at home. You have to be within a Family Search Center to get them, okay? And so again, you're also, again, remember these are separate governments. So you're gonna have typical local marriage records like uh, courts, deeds, citizenship cases, all of this before we even get to statehood. No, think about it. If you do research outside of the, the Oklahoma area or the Indian territory, one of the hardest things we have is that 20 year time span that I call the black hole between 1881 and 1899 where we don't have a census. So people are relying on local records. This is an exact example of why you need to rely on local records or tribal records prior to the 1907 admission of Oklahoma as a state, okay? You also have um, connections to a great museum, a great museum in Tulsa, the Gilcrease Museum, their digital um, providings are incredible, okay? Digitized stuff where they have them transcribed, they have tags for the people mentioned. You can download them in the comfort of your home. If you've never heard of Gilcrease, go ahead and head there, okay? They are just, oh, I'm telling you, you guys are missing out. This is incredible stuff in Oklahoma. So other collections that document Freedmen, and this one you, it's probably gonna surprise you, Records of Antebellum Southern Plantations. This was a collection that was put together by a professor of records that exist at universities and colleges across the country that reference enslavement. What do I mean by this? Rebecca McIntosh, Hawkins Haggerty, who was a Creek, a slaveholding Creek, her documents are within the records of Antebellum Southern Plantations. You can find that on Family Search in the catalog, just browse to it. There's a guide that literally lists out everything. She had relations and connections to just about all the five tribes. You are looking at an inventory and appraisement of the estate of Spiro Haggerty, minor heir Spiro M. Haggerty, appraised by Rebecca Haggerty. Notice in green, it says one, being one, a number of enslaved person named Mary Dickens, who was age 35. And as of this inventory, she had an, an enslaved value of $500. Just like you research slaveholders outside of the Indian territory, you research them the same way in. Okay, Gilcrease, again, I found records documenting slaves in the five tribes on the Gilcrease website. Did you know that? Yes, it's in Tulsa. <laughs> Gilcrease.org, I believe is the, the URL because I'm constantly going there. Okay, their collections are in parallel. And you're probably thinking, 
why is all the why are all the tribal documents like why is this stuff all over the place? I say for the Cherokee Nation, it's like imagine if you were walking across a, a quad between two high rise buildings and you were holding a ream of paper, and a big gust of wind came, and or maybe you were walking in your heels and you tripped on a crack and you fell down and the paper went all over the place. That is literally like what is what it is researching tribal documents sometimes, because a lot of the stuff came into the possession of the Oklahoma Historical Society. Some of it is with state archives, like with the state of Tennessee. Right here in Nashville, we have a brand spanking new uh, you know, state archives. Some of it is in private collections and museums. Some of it is with colleges and universities. Again, like the Sequoia National Research Center at the University of Arkansas. And what you have to remember is we are in this place now where um, organizations, they are really you know, pushing forward towards digitizing things. And so there's a lot, you all, that's not digitized. It's not even microfilmed. You might have to go there to do it, but if we show the interest and say, hey, we really want these documents, we're really researching these people, look, we don't know. Maybe we can help them with grants and other things to get it, right? I don't know, contact Ancestry, have them scan it, right? Or even family search. But records are all over the place. So next, well, I've spent a lot of time talking about Friedman. Again, I can talk about I can talk about us forever, okay? But we also have a conversation about state Negroes. Now you might hear that term and be like, Nika, really did you say that? And yes, I did. And the reason why is because there was a difference between Friedman and state Negroes. What are state Negroes? Well, state Negroes are the individuals who came to Oklahoma, those homesteaders, okay? When you read through Dawes applications of people who were part of the five tribes, they oftentimes refer to people who were from the United States as a state Negro. That's what that means. It's not they were came from an estate. It's not, I mean, they might have if they were enslaved, right? But it means actual United States, okay? Think about this. Between 1865 and 1920, African-Americans founded more than 50 black settlements in Oklahoma. That's more than any other state. 50. The earliest settlements began with who? Freeman of the Five Tribes. Come on now, right? What are we talking? There are there, a lot of these towns have 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 they're no longer in existence, but 13 remain. We're talking Bowley, Brooksville, Clearview, Langston, Lima, Lincoln City, Redburg, Rentiesville, Summit, Taft, Tatums, Tallahassee, Vernon. Matter of fact, let me, let me drop this little gem on you. There's an incredible documentary called Struggle and Hope that is airing now during Black History Month on PBS stations. What is the document? It talks about these Black towns in Oklahoma. One of the things that it mentions is that the individuals who came and settled as state Negroes, 89ers or homesteaders, right? Them along with the Freedom of the Five Tribes owned more than one and a half million acres of land in the state of Oklahoma. Why are we not talking about Oklahoma more? Come on now, join me, join me all of you, okay? So let's talk about more, okay? We have individuals who are luminaries of this community of state Negroes and 89ers and homesteaders, people who are encouraging people to move to Oklahoma, like Edward P. McCabe, who was pictured there top right, who was an early leader and a founder of Langston. Okay, we have established systems. People, all oh, you might, you haven't even heard me talk about Tulsa because Tulsa is one story, one, one of many. Okay, these are entire systems including colleges like Langston University that still exist to this day. Now, because of Senate bill number one, a lot of people who migrated to the Indian territory or to Oklahoma, right? They left and they repatriated to Canada because they didn't wanna be under the same thumb of racism and Jim Crow that they were in the deep South or maybe that they had experienced living in the Indian territory. Right. One thing that people fail to realize is just because um, slavery is perceived to be more gentle amongst the five tribes, that there weren't things like slave codes. And there weren't things like slave revolts, which one happened in the Cherokee Nation in 1842. So just back to that whole 
you know, Senate Bill Number One sort of codifying what was happening in the area already, right? Again, this is this is a this is people being autonomous. This is people actualizing what they wanted their lives to look like. And again, scores of people, thousands, you can find in the newspaper where individuals left Oklahoma and moved to Canada. All right, third section. Let's talk about federal records because we talked a lot about tribal records, okay? And what you can find um, in those particular collections. And of course, we're talking about stuff that's documenting black people in Oklahoma, okay? Um, so federal government records. Remember I talked about M234, okay? When I tell you I was so mad at Angela and Terry for telling me about this collection, it is like a thousand rolls of microfilm. What is it? It is literally the Bureau of Indian Affairs within the nation, especially if you're talking about freedmen. And those numbers that I got from that census or that those statistics came from a record I saw in M234. It is everything from letters to um, lists where you are literally seeing the detachment list of people during the forced removal, where they actually have the listing of the people who are leaving, the number of enslaved that they are bringing with them, uh, the more lists, letters, um, statements, um, even, even affidavits, things that people are signing. I mean, it is a, as Angela just said, it is a gold mine. Now, here's the thing. Plan your time out because this stuff is not indexed. Now, it is um, organized by year, okay? And so then that way you can kind of have an idea. If you're looking for a particular thing that may have happened at a particular time, you might be able to find it. I even found a passbook in this collection for individuals who were coming from other Southern states and had to pass through the Cherokee Nation in order for them to get into locations like Natchez, Mississippi. And within that passbook, they are mentioning that it's not just the person's family, but how many enslaved people. I could sit here all day and talk about M234. Um, <laughs> and I'm laughing at the chat because someone asked Angela if she's planning on writing a book. Angela has written more than one book and I'm going to be telling you about it later. All right, Civil War. Woo, this is another untapped area. Y'all don't even understand it's getting so good. Okay, U.S. Colored Troops, give a round of applause to the 1st Kansas United States Colored, Reg uh, United States Colored Troops 79th Regiment. Why are we clapping for them? Because they were the first unit mustered in to see battle and to have casualties in the Civil War. I know you love Denzel. I know you love Morgan Freeman. I know you love Matthew Broderick, but the 54th Massachusetts only counts as being first because they were mustered in first to service with the Union. But in terms of a state issued or created regiment, the first, the first, 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 first is the first Kansas, which my great great grandfather Isaac Rogers was enlisted in that unit. We have the second Kansas, which became the 83rd of the US, US color troops. These regiments were made up of who? Freemen of the five tribes. Yes, bless them all. We also have the first, second, and third Indian Home Guards. Why do we care? Well, think about it, y'all. If we have no other clues on who a slaveholder is, and you know, I'm getting ready to get into some more federal documents that will actually give that information. But let's say you hadn't gone to a DOS person and you're looking up somebody who is enlisted in one of these regiments. If you pull their Civil War pension file, they will tell you a lot of times who the slaveholder is. In fact, you're looking at a card for Charles Rogers, who was one of my great great uncles, who was a part of company, looks like J, maybe G, it is G, of the second Indian Home Guards. And his slaveholder was Clement Van Rogers, who was the father of humorist and comedian. Will Rogers. How do I know he's a slaveholder? Because Charles Rogers needed to prove his date of birth. And he went to Will Rogers' aunt to verify his date of birth because she was the niece of Clement Van Rogers, or the sister actually of Clement Van Rogers. And because she knew that Charles was born around the same time as her, they used her statement. Yes. Did any of these regiments defend the Union Fort in Baxter Springs? Absolutely, they did. Honey Springs, come on now, Poison Springs. Yes, yes, get all of your life. If there is someone watching who wants to make a movie about the first Kansas, just holler at a player. Me and Angela, we got you, okay? Again, know these regiments because they're connected to five tribes freedmen, all right? Now, more records. 
Civil War stuff. You got your Civil War service records, the pensions I just talked about, other wars and conflicts. Don't forget, again, once we get into statehood, you have state level records or records that you know are for the state of Oklahoma. You got World War I draft cards, World War II, Vietnam records, okay? You also have court. This is one of my favorite things, Fort Smith. It was going down in Fort Smith, okay? The Fort Smith criminal case files, okay? The US government had jurisdiction for crimes in the, the Indian territory. And people were getting arrested for all kinds of stuff, okay? You have, um, my gosh, let's see. Ike Rogers was US deputy marshal. He lost his commission because somebody claimed he extorted them. How did I find that out? I found that in the Fort Smith criminal case files. Fort Smith, the most notorious judge known there was one named Isaac Parker. He was hanging up everybody. If you watch The Heart of They Fall and you saw Cherokee Bill get shot in the neck and bleed out in the middle of town, that is not how that man died. Ike Rogers captured him and delivered him to the gallows in Fort Smith where he was hung. Learn the story, okay? Now, the Fort Smith case files, those are all on ancestry, okay? We also have inmate case files, um, which those are selected records for places like Fort Leavenworth. Okay, which were federal prisons, you will even find mugshots of people who were in the Indian Territory in those inmate case files that are on the National Archives catalog. Okay, Senate subcommittee hearings. Oh my gosh, this is another in incredible thing where you can find ancestors or people you're researching who sat down and gave their testimony to the Senate around relations between the five tribes and their freedmen. Again, Isaac Rogers was one of those individuals who did it, but he was not the only one. Those records are a part of the congressional serial set and they are on Google Books. You can even find them on Hathi Trust as well. Now let's talk about the Dawes Commission because most people, if they've ever been introduced to the freedmen of the five tribes, they know about the Dawes Commission, okay? And so with the Dawes Commission, it was a, it was a step process. People would come in, they would attest to who their parents were. They would give their age. In fact, you're looking at a picture of Chickasaw Freedmen filing for allotments through the Dawes Commission. That's an actual photo of people doing that, participating in that process, okay? So the first step, you have the Dawes application card that will tell you whether or not the person was approved or rejected, okay? Every card has an application pro uh, packet that goes with it. Do not assume that just because um, you found a person noted twice that the file is exactly the same. In my experience, no. If someone was put on a doubtful card to begin with and it went to approved or the doubtful went to rejected and they had two files, I often find more paper in the rejection than I do the original doubtful card or doubt, doubtful packet. So always, you know, do your comparisons between the documents that are there. You can find DOS cards on Ancestry and Fold3. There's an index that's available to the Oklahoma Historical Society. The packets are available on Ancestry and on Fold3. You will only get to an allotment jacket if the person was approved, meaning they went through the process, they were approved, they were found to have, uh, you know, adhere to the, the portion of the treaty that they were supposed to adhere to. And so then they got their land allotment. Okay. Within that, I have seen everything from, of course, the typical, here's where your, your land is with the township, the range and the section where you can use that and plot out where the allotment is now to letters and all sorts of stuff within the allotment jacket. So remember, it is card, packet, jacket only if they were approved. Now the jackets also exist on family search, okay? And so the other thing I wanna bring up with the DOS Commission, I would be remiss if I did not talk about Equity Case 7071, which includes the Choctaw and Chickasaw Freedmen. What is this? This is between 1,600 and 2,000 Choctaw and Chickasaw Freedmen who sought to be moved from the Freedmen roll to the Bible roll. Now here's one thing you need to know about application cards. They were segregated. Even if you were known to have a degree of Indian blood, a lot of times we were put on a Freedman card, which there was no field for Indian blood on that card. Which means that if your father was a Chickasaw or Choctaw or Cherokee or Muscogee Creek or a Seminole, right? And your mother was black and was enslaved by one of those nations, they would put you on your mother's card and thus you could not claim blood. So I want to call attention to Equity Case 7071 because again, these are, up to 2,000 Choctaw and Chickasaw freedmen who sought to be moved from the freedman role to the by blood role. Had they been successful in being able to do that, their descendants would be able to get citizenship right now. But because 
they were not moved and they were supposed to be, they now are not entitled to citizenship. That's how volatile this situation is, okay? So factor that in. Of course, I got to shout out Betty's List, which is a blog by Terry Ligon that um, lays out um, so much stuff about Equity Case 7071. All right, more records, because I ain't done, y'all. I still got some more slides, so there's a lot more in here. It's good eating, I told you. Eastern Cherokee applications. If you find any connection to the Cherokee Nation and a freedman, I need you to be searching, okay, these Eastern Cherokee. What do I mean? Okay, these are applications that were submitted for shares of money that was appropriated. Remember I told you these lists and roles and applications, so many of this stuff, it was created to, to disperse funds, okay? So here's another scenario. And so these applications were submitted for shares of money that was appropriated for the Eastern Cherokee, the individuals who were forcibly removed. And it was not some, you know, it was not, it was not, the process didn't begin until June 30th, 1906. So think about the forced removal, 1830s, 1840s. This process for these applications didn't begin until 1906. And so these are part of the Guillaume Miller enrollment records, okay? There were more than 45,000 applications who were filed and Freedmen filed applications. Why do I care? Look at this example. This is for my great-great-grandmother. She lists her name. She lists where she lived She in the Indian Territory, her age, where she was born, if she was married, who her husband's name was, who the name of her children were and when they were born. And I will tell you, Clara Rogers, whose name is right there, is over my shoulder right here. Then she had to name her parents. Then she had to name her grandparents on both sides. The name of her siblings. Who was forcibly removed during that process? You can get four and five, potentially, I definitely say four generations worth of information off these applications. And I feel like too many of us focus on the DOS cards and forget to look at these Eastern Cherokee. So if you have any connections, please do that. These are available on fold three, all right? Homestead records, whoo, yes. So all those state Negroes, 89ers and homesteaders, you wanna look up the land patents. Those are a part of the Bureau of Land Management website where you can actually pull the documents that show the, the legal land description of their land and, and map it. But then there's also a process where you can get the homestead application where it has affidavits and all kinds of stuff in there, okay? Those are available at the National Archives. In fact, I want to point out that there's a whole homestead project that has been started by the National Park Service and Angela Walton Raji, Shelly Murphy, in particular, Bernice Alexander Bennett, one of my sorors and genealogy buddies, is leading the way, getting people who were homesteaders, their descendants to write up um, profiles on who they were, where they came from, all that stuff, and extracting details from those homestead applications, okay? So more, uh, more. Right, someone's asking for slides, maybe, we'll see. <laughs> so more government, did you know that there's a slave schedules for the Indian territory? Did you know that? Yes, there is. You probably didn't know that it exists because it's filed in with Arkansas. Oh yeah, oh yeah, let me ruin your night and your weekend. Yes, yes, I'm doing it, I can feel it, I can feel it. Browse, okay, I need you to browse. Why do you browse? Because some of the some of the, the handwriting was misread. So it could be Cherokee, Cherokee, right? All the districts are ref reflected. So you will actually see who the slaveholders were in 1860 in the five tribes. But they're in Arkansas. They're not in with quote unquote Indian territory. Okay. So that will get, that will help you along with the information you have on the DOS card. And I can't even believe I didn't even mention this, but I, I apologize for not thinking about it. The DOS cards say who slaveholders are. If the individual was alive for enslavement, there's a, there's a field on that part, the front part of the DOS card that says slave of. Freedmen DOS cards have two sides. Quote, by bloods do not. So you'll get the slave of on the front for the individual, or their children, on the back you will get it for that individual's mother and father. No hunting around trying to find who the slaveholder is. The names are clearly there on the DOS cards. And of course you can supplement that information when looking on the 1860 slave schedules. Of course, again, statehood, right? 
you we have a the the nineteen hundred census, even though Oklahoma wasn't a state until nineteen oh seven, there was a territorial census that's a part of the federal u s census in nineteen hundred. OK, you also have the following censuses, 1910, 20, 30, 40. And in about 60 days, we're going to have 1950. OK, so keep that in mind. You also have territorial before 1900. You've got certain counties in Oklahoma that have a territorial census in 1890. Beaver, Canadian, Cleveland, Kingfisher, Logan, Oklahoma and Payne counties are reflected there. You also have the 1907 Seminole County. Oh, that goes back to Freedman. Utilize your resources. We, look, y'all think I'm done? I'm not. Because there's more in Oklahoma because we just dealt with tribal records. We dealt with federal records. Let's talk about local because even that is off the chain. This picture, Ruth Arnold, who's on the left, who was the director of admissions at the University of Oklahoma, took the enrollment papers of G.W. McLaurin, retired Negro educator who became the first of his race to be admitted to the 58-year-old state university. Let's give him his flowers. It's Black History Month. We got our own Harriet Tubmans and, and Booker T's and, and, and W.E.B. Du Bois in, in, in Oklahoma. Let's lift them up, right? Okay, county and state records. What are we talking about? Vitals. Do y'all understand? The Oklahoma, the Oklahoma State Vital Records has a website. It's free 99. You can search births and deaths. Yes, I'm ready today because I, I, I feel like y'all don't be giving Oklahoma what needs to be given. Then we're going to give it today. OK, so you can search births and deaths. You can pull the index up. And here's the best part. You can order the certificate. In fact, I think it only costs. I want to say it only costs five dollars. Right. So if you're confused or not sure when someone died or maybe you're checking a date of death, you can go right there to Oklahoma State Vital Records. OK, more marriages. They exist on Ancestry and Family Search. OK, so we have those that are searchable deed records. Oh, my gosh. I need you guys to get in here. OK, the Family Search catalog browse to your respective county in Oklahoma. Pull up the deed records, get the index go to the respective book and page and you can see when business was transacted between your ancestors and other people, okay? Those are free. You can access them at home for free. Court records, same thing. Do you all understand that if a child was given an allotment during the Dawes, Dawes period and their family wanted to sell that land off that they had to get permission from the court to do so, they had to have a guardian who served as the to make sure that the child wasn't being defrauded right they had to go through a whole court process that's paper we love paper dig into those court records again on the family search catalog they're free you can also find probates my 15 year old aunt had a probate why because she got an allotment through the dawes commission okay think about again 1.5 million acres that had to descend down or people had to lose it some way. Which means that if they died and they had, to, they had to lay it all out like a regular probate, those are on Ancestry. You can also get to them on a uh, family search, okay? School records, come, y'all listen, it goes down to Oklahoma, okay? Do you know they had a school census for the state of Oklahoma? What do I mean? School age children were enumerated on their own census. The only other state that has this is Mississippi. What do we have? The name, the age, the name of the parent, where they lived, and it's year after year after year after year. So what you can't find a birth certificate? Did you go to the Oklahoma school records? That's what people would have potentially used to validate birth. Again, we don't have these school records like we have them in Oklahoma anywhere else. Mississippi has it, but baby, let me tell you, Oklahoma has it. I still ain't done. Newspapers, oh my gosh. Y'all, if you were doing newspaper research in Oklahoma and you, matter of fact, if you were doing any research in Oklahoma and you are not using newspapers, I need you to throw the laptop across the room and ask God why, okay? 
newspapers. What do we have? Oklahoma Historical Society has a whole collection on the gateway to Oklahoma that is just black papers in Oklahoma. they have is not what newspapers.com or what genealogy bank has wait and then we got the throw in chronicle of america from the library of congress all of these papers y'all again that crucial time period between 1880 and 1900 censuses where everybody in the world is like i can't find my answers where well, oh i don't know we don't suffer from that in the indian territory in oklahoma because our papers were the bomb okay y'all you can spend weeks just on newspapers in the IT in Oklahoma. And I'm not just talking prior to 1907, I'm talking after. How do I even know my great grandmother fundraised for the Red Cross during World War I? Because I found it in the newspaper in Oklahoma. Really, seriously, if you don't take anything else that I mentioned, and I mentioned a lot of stuff today, newspapers should be on the top of your list, okay? Pioneer Papers, y'all, wait a minute, hold on, we got to go back. Mm -mm, no, we got to start this slide again because I need to give these Indian, Indian uh, Pioneer Papers. What am I talking about? Have you heard of the slave narratives? Right, where 3,000 formerly enslaved people were interviewed about their lives during enslavement. Did you know that we have an equivalent to that in Oklahoma? really hope I messed up your whole weekend. Because if you didn't know that, here is where I tell you. Scores of individuals across the nations were interviewed about their lives as formerly enslaved people. They are naming details like who of the enslaving families, children, lived where, where people are buried, if they served in the war, uh, what would life was like pre-removal, after removal. You are getting incredible detail. Again, it's the equivalent to the slave narratives, but in the IT, okay? You can find those on the Oklahoma, um, University of Oklahoma has them. They have iteration on ancestry. Please do not overlook this. Even if your ancestor, because I don't have direct ancestors that were part of the Indian Pioneer Papers, but I have collateral family members and people who were enslaved by the same people that I found a slave uh, a Pioneer Paper interview, okay? And these were done well after uh, the slave narratives were done. Okay. Thank you, Miss Angela. University of Oklahoma Western History Collection. Oh, my Lord. The Oklahoma Department of Libraries, their digital prairie. Did you know I found images from Tulsa, from the Tulsa, the Tulsa riot massacre that I had never seen that were on the Oklahoma Department of Libraries digital prairie? There are in incredible things on there. Again, but we're over here thinking, oh, we can't get to stuff in person. No, we haven't exhausted everything that's online. Okay? So there's incredible stuff there. Langston University has its own archive. Okay? Yearbooks, all that kind of stuff. So if you have an ancestor who attended school there, you need to be looking at their archive. Burials. We have a ton of, of you know, 89ers, Freedom of the Five Tribes cemeteries all across Oklahoma. Many of them are documented on things like find a grave or billion graves. And there are even projects where local folks in some of these areas are starting to go in and preserve and document the history. Okay, so that's available as well. I got to shout out the Oklahoma Historical Society. What are we talking about here? Black history is Oklahoma history. They have an entire page that talks about much of the stuff that I talked about today about the black towns and, and the early luminaries and, and it connects you to the history. Their encyclopedia that's on their site is unparalleled, okay? We have the research center that's at the Oklahoma Historical Society. I've been talking about the gateway to Oklahoma history, but all these incredible pictures you're seeing today came off the gateway. It's so easy to search and the, the newspapers are there, right? All of the stuff I've been mentioning to you, uh, most of it is on the gateway. Some of the cooler collections that i found, there was an unemployed relief census. If you've learned anything about Oklahoma in this presentation, you know we're going to put together a list. <laughs> Baby, it's going to be a list. And it's not going to be when the census happens, OK? It's going to be some other time, OK, whenever we feel like it. And there was an unemployed relief census in 1933 that you can search for individuals in your family. This was during the Great Depression. I found family members of mine in there. There also are the state penitentiary prisoner cards, which some of those include photos of the individuals. 
right? There's also a whole list of things for freedmen specifically for, for us, those of us who are freedmen. I mean, goodness gracious, it is, it is just, again, shout out to the Oklahoma Historical Society who has been holding it all the way down for those of us with connections to Oklahoma. All right, last but not least, we gotta cover everything else that I did not talk out talk about, okay? What am I referencing? A lot of stuff, right? Um, we're talking about things like the Cherokee Nation Research Center, right? That's where you perform genealogy research. We're talking about church and religious and organizational records, right? We're also talking about books. What books am I talking about? Black Indians and Freedmen, the African Methodist Episcopal Church and Indigenous Americans from 1816 to 1916 by Christina Dickerson Cousin. I've been here all the while. Black Freedom on Native Land, Elena Roberts, Ties That Bind, The Story of Afro-American Cherokee Family and Slavery and Freedom by Taya Miles. The House on Diamond Hill, Cherokee Plantation Story, also by Taya Miles. Freedom of the Frontier, Volume 1 and 2 by Angela Walton Raji. Black Indian Genealogy Research by Angela Walton Raji. Black Indians, A Hidden Heritage by William Lauren Katz, Red Over Black by Black, Black Slavery Among Cherokee Indians by R. Halliburton Jr. There are blogs, there are websites, there's the Oklahoma Freedmen Collective, okfreedmen.org. Angela has a whole entire blog, the African Native American Genealogy blog. She also has Choctaw Freedmen information. She's a Choctaw Freedman. Terry has Black and Red Journal. He's a Chickasaw Freedman. There is so much available, y'all. There really, really is. I know I water hosed you. I know I did, but it was for good reason because I knew you'd have questions. But I hope I have thrown you completely off. <laughs> A lot of people in the chat are saying you've ruined their weekends, Nika. <laughs> oh, that was that, that. I hoped. I hoped. I, I hope to be a nice and weekend killer. I hope. They're gonna, you're keeping people up at night. So um, we do have some questions. Um, we'll have, we'll, we'll take a few of them so we can, uh, I know people have some time constraints probably, but we'll get some questions going. Um, we have a question uh, from Russell. Can you discuss whether and how some descendants of freedmen got classified as Indians quote by blood? Right, so it depends um, if they're, and, and here's the thing, I hate sounding like Judy Russell because Judy Russell always says it depends. Um, even if people were well known in the community to be both freedmen and by blood, right? Um, there wasn't there wasn't a uniform policy on how they were addressed with the DOS Commission. You you will have families where it, again it is known that the the father is Chickasaw or Cherokee or whatever, um, and the mother is a freedman. Where one of the kids gets in, gets approved um, on the by blood role, and then the siblings are on the freedman role. It, it, it was, we don't really know why. Um, I wish I could go back, you know, Mr. Tams Bigsby, <laughs> who's on everybody's, you know, Dawes application. I wish I could ask him, but it was not uniform. Um, so it really is on a case by case basis. And where you kind of get the, the gist of what was going on, you really need to dig deeply into those Dawes applications. And I can say this is somebody that has, you know, my entire, my paternal grandmother, both sides of her family are, were freedmen of the Cherokee Nation. And there, I have to constantly go back to files. You can't just read it once because when you go through the information one time, it reads one way, you find information later, it could read completely differently. Um, and so, yeah, there, there was no, I wish there was a blanket. We love blankets in America. We don't, we don't really like nuance. Nuance throws us off. Um, but the Dawes process was nuance. Very. Um, <laughs> there's there's also a question from Sierra. Is there a list of rejected folks from the Dawes rolls? Oh yeah, um, the, the rejected. Um, you can even select that as a category when you do searches, right? Like I just want to see rejected people. Maybe you know make the category freedmen and then rejected. Um, but remember, a person applies, it could be doubtful, mm. and go to rejected or doubtful and go to approved. So it's that three tier process. Um, and so, yeah, the, the rejected files, approved files, those are on full three and ancestry, just like Miss Angela said. She's right there. She's got my back. She's been putting in links and all kinds of stuff. Thank you um, for that. Oh yeah. Um, there's I think some of these questions may have already been answered by some people in the in the chat. Um uh, uh, in regards to Dawes cards, um, Leslie asked, did it list all slaveholder names if the individual had more than one owner? 
No, typically it usually from my experience, it's been the last or sometimes it might be the first. Like if uh, like one of my ancestors was enslaved by Avery Van and Avery Van had like 12 children. And so he while he was known or listed as a slaveholder, my my third grade grandfather actually went to his daughter. And he didn't say that he went to his daughter, but when you start reading through the files and getting more context, it's listed as Avery Van, but it was actually a daughter. So it's not a catch-all, like every slaveholder, it's gonna be one of them. Um, and, and you can't necessarily, it's just like with, you know, whether or not the enslaved chose the last name of the last slaveholder, you can't make an assumption that it's just the last one. It's a slaveholder. It could be the last one. It could be the one that they had the longest. Um, again, nuance. <laughs> it, it could be, it could be, but at least we're getting a name. Um, there's a question about the school records. Where do you find the Oklahoma school records and would they include the Bowley training school? Oh yeah, if it's in Oklahoma, it's gonna be in the school records. Um, you can find those on uh, Family Search. And I, I will also caution, for some reason, the indexing is a little funky. Um, so don't assume if you only found one record that there aren't more. I found more by browsing. I really need us to learn to love the process of browsing. Browsing is great. We don't ever want to stop browsing because again, if you're a woman who likes shoes like I do, you may miss out on the best, best deal and the cutest shoes because you were just scanning through instead of browsing. So browse. Um, there was a question about um, people moving to surrounding states. Um, let me find that, I'm sorry. Um, it said, did freed people migrate to the surrounding states after 1866? Um, this person- They did, did. Yeah. they did. Yeah. Yes. So um, Grandma Clara, her mother, um, mother was a was a Cherokee freedman. Her her maternal grandparents migrated into Kansas. You'll find a lot of spillover into places like Fort Scott, uh, Independence, Coffeeville, um, even into Missouri. There's a bunch of spillover of freedmen of the five tribes, even into northern Texas, Marshall, Texas. In fact, um, more recently, I was given an incredible document that my aunt wrote. Um, one of the two little girls on that that picture um, where she talks about how um, Grandma Sarah's two brothers were sold off out of the Cherokee Nation into Texas. And I believe I've actually found their descendants through DNA and they ended up in Marshall, Marshall Texas. So yes, Texas, um, you know, uh, Eastern Texas, Northeastern Texas, um, South uh, Eastern Kansas, Southwestern Missouri, uh, you start going to Joplin. It's like a whole, it's like a, um, I don't know, it's like a mud there a little bit. And people would hop across the border. And here's the best part. When you get to Kansas, their newspapers are just as good as they are in the IT. So oh, I'm telling you. And then Kansas, well, right. We could talk all day about Kansas too, because if you have folks that went to that, spi that space, you not only have incredible Oklahoma records, but you also have incredible Kansas ones too. Um, and then one person wants a little bit of clarification on the Indian Home Guard. Um, she's asking, were the soldiers in the Indian Home Guard Native peoples, Black freedmen, or Black members of the five tribes, or all of the above? All of the above. All right. Um, one kind of wrap-up question, I guess, would be, what is the best way to start a journey? This person's specifically asking about their Choctaw heritage, but what would be the way to just kind of start? So any process for genealogy, whether it's African-American or someone who, who's white, it all starts the same. You always start with you, catalog what you know going forward, involve conversations with, you know, your relatives or even fictive kin. You know, if your mom got a good friend or dad has a good friend, grandparents have a good friend that knows your family. You want to take inventory of all that, then gather stuff from your home. There are clues hiding all around you that people just don't pay attention to then start the process of searching. Don't start it with the vantage point of, I'm trying to prove I'm Choctaw. No, you're trying to find your ancestors. And if you're able to validate whether or not you're Choctaw, that's a bonus. But you're trying to give life to these people who at one point were, um, were property and who did not have a voice. And so start from that vantage point. Then once you hit 1910, right, ish, 1907, that's when you start to make that pivot to see if your ancestors were enslaved by the five tribes or were enslaved by the Choctaw or whether they came as state Negroes or homesteaders, right? That's where you make that pivot. And, and a lot of times we'll hear uh, certain surnames 
if people bring up a city, like if I hear someone say Benita, Oklahoma, I'm like, I already know you were Cherokee Freeman. Cause like who else is going there, right? I'll hear certain surnames. Um, I brought up that documentary, Struggle and Hope that's on PBS. You can watch it from now almost until infinity online um, where they're in um, Rentiesville in Tallahassee. And one of the families have the last name Nero. And I was like, they're Freedmen. Like I knew immediately. So get yourself immersed, get your foundation set in terms of your genealogy. And then when you get to that statehood time period, that's where you need to pivot just how you would out of the nations um, or out of the territory where you have to pivot during the slavery era, you're pivoting much more recently in Oklahoma to determine whether your folks were five tribes freedmen or if they had come from another state. Right. Um, well, again, I wanna thank you, Nika, for sharing your knowledge and your boundless energy with us this afternoon. Um, to those of you watching or listening out there, thank you for joining us. Uh, we encourage you to take what you learned today and apply it. For information about today's presenter, you can visit Nika Smith's website at who is nikasmith.com. If you need a starting point for your genealogy journey, please feel free to visit the OHS's Kirkpatrick Research Center located on the first floor of the Oklahoma History Center in Oklahoma City. Uh, you can visit Tuesday through Saturday from 10 a.m. to 4.45 p.m. Or you can go online to www.okhistory.org forward slash research to see all the resources available online through the OHS. This presentation will be available on the OHS's YouTube channel next week, likely next Tuesday. So if you need a refresher on what we what Nika went over today um, and or you just need a nice shot in the arm of energy um, to get you going on your research journey, uh, it will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, thank you again for joining us today and best of luck on everybody's family history quest. Thank you. Yes, awesome. Have a great day.